Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, while I do these introductory comments, uh, why don't we have our panelists come on up and take their seats. Uh, just a couple of words um, I'm excited about today, and I'm excited about the energy in a room and the people in this room. Uh, and I, I hope this next topic, this changing cultural norms, is a lesson in making the past prologue. Uh, in that Michael had referenced two topics where we seemed, as a society, to be able to bend the curve. Uh, he talked about automobiles, uh, which historically have been the leading cause of death in the United States, and he also talked about smoking. Uh, I remember a time in the 80s where I had no problem jumping into a car, regardless of the seatbelt or not, and zooming off to uh, my next event. Uh, I remember a time not too long ago where we went to a restaurant and it was a smoke-filled room that you entered into. So the question is, can we bend the curve? Uh, but we're dealing with an intractable issue. We're dealing with behavior change and multiply that on a societal setting. And I can tell you that at Northwell, we're very proud of a few small steps that we've made in collaboration with a number of health systems. I'm gonna talk about that for just a second. And we were inspired by this chart. Um, this is a study that was published in, um, by the CDC in the, the New England Journal of Medicine. The author is actually in the room, uh, Dr. Rebecca Cunningham. Rebecca, where are you? All right, excellent. Stand up for a second. Um, and you can see uh, an absurd statistic on this chart, that guns are now the leading cause of death of children in this country. Uh, that is a tragedy. Um, but in that tragedy is energy, is an opportunity. If you think about it, that Rubicon that we've crossed, we can tap into energy and reframe the conversation as a safety conversation. We can tap into the natural instincts that we have as parents to protect our children. So Northwell launched a campaign to do that. I would also suggest that there's optimism on this chart. You may, it may be hard to find, but look at the curve on automobile accidents. And we've been able to bend that. So clearly and hopefully, the past can be prologue. So let me play a little bit of the work that we've done to, let's play the video if we could. Thank you so much. We just wanted to ask, and it's totally cool. There's no issue. The uh, um, the tiger. Um, and we were just wondering if he'll be locked up. Yeah, will the tiger be locked up for the whole time? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> we never let him out with kids around. Not even our own. It doesn't kill to ask about <laughs> unlocked guns in the house. Health, New York State's largest health system, is encouraging parents to ask others about the status of guns in their homes. A provocative PSA puts parents on the spot and urges conversations about unsecured guns in the home. The issue of guns is controversial, but, but the damage to kids and families and doing something to prevent it should never be controversial. So um, a small first step, hopefully in behavior change, in culture change, but entering into a conversation that sadly we've never had to have before, uh, but it's an appropriate time to take action. 
Um, I'm most optimistic about this chart. This was um, the results of that campaign. And uh, we held out a control group who were not exposed to the advertising. About 14% of them would ask, is there an unlocked gun in a the house? Then we uh, also exposed it to a, a large uh, group of individuals, um, all cultures, um, all ethnic backgrounds, about 35% of them who were exposed would ask the question. I'm most optimistic about the parents, 70%, once exposed and once they understood that this was a safety issue, would actually take action. So let's dig into this conversation on a deeper basis. It's my pleasure to introduce this panel. By the way, you guys have plenty of time, so you take all the time that you need. Um, uh, let's start with Anthony. Anthony Signorelli, he's a senior vice president with the Ad Council, uh, a storied organization that has helped bend many of those curves that we've talked about in the past. Uh, I was talking to Anthony last night and learned that the Ad Council um, negotiates and represents about a billion dollars of media put into the market every year. Uh, an incredibly powerful organization to help build and bend cultural change. Um, I'd like to introduce Nina Vinek. Do I have that right, Vina? Excellent. Vina is, um, sorry, it's Nina. Did Nina. I okay, Nina, so I, I apologize. Nina, Nina is the founder and executive director of um, Project Unloaded. And uh, our moderator today will be Fatima Loren Dreyer. Dreyer, thank you so much. <laughs> So uh, I like to call her the fabulous Fatima. Uh, welcome. Thank you for leading this organization. Fatima is the executive director of the Health Alliance of Violence Intervention. I'll hand it over to this panel. Please give them a warm welcome for the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramon, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Fatima Loren Dreyer, again, and Executive Director of the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention and the Executive Director of Kaiser Permanente's Center for Gun Violence Research and Education. And I'm joined by Nina and Anthony for a very important discussion about uh, how to change cultural norms and perspectives through communications. Uh, I'm really excited to dive in, and I want to talk about the why. Why is it important to change cultural norms? Um, so help us understand that and, and give us a sense of what specific norms are we actually trying to change. Now, Nina, I'll have you start. Great. Thank you so much, Fatima. And big thank you to Northwell Health for uh, organizing this amazing conference. So I'm going to push us to get a little bit outside of our comfort zones on this issue. So the work of Project Unloaded really begins with a simple data point. So 20 years ago, most Americans knew that guns made them less safe and household gun ownership was on the decline. Today, most Americans have bought into the myth that guns make us safer and that's leading more and more Americans to choose to own guns and bring guns into their homes and communities and that's contributing to rising rates of gun violence. Now it may seem like Gun culture is an intractable part of American life, but it's actually quite new. And at Project Unloaded, we're confident that young people are going to be the ones to change that culture. So we've already heard about the devastating impact that gun violence is having on uh, children and teens today. It's now the leading cause of death for young people. And you know, we also know that mass shootings and school shootings are weighing extremely heavily on this generation. We know that you know, these shootings make up a fraction of overall gun violence, but young people tell our researchers that they're thinking about mass shootings and worrying about them at least on a weekly basis, if not more often. So the trauma of gun violence is really making this a top tier concern for young people today. But we also know that young people, and Gen Z in particular, that their opinions and preferences are shaping our culture right now and into the future, including whether gun use and gun violence will continue to rise or 
whether we can begin to reverse those trends in the coming years. So at Project Unloaded, we're reaching teens through large scale cultural social media campaigns with accurate information about gun violence to inspire the next generation to choose on their own terms not to use guns. You know, changing the culture starts with changing the narrative. And so our mission at Project Unloaded is to create a new cultural narrative that guns make us less safe. And we're empowering Gen Z to be the agents of that change. Powerful, thank you. Yeah, that's very powerful. Yeah, at the Ad Council, um, we've been involved in changing culture since we were established in 1942. And the way that we do that is through communications. We use the best of marketing to influence the conversation and, as Nina said, you know, change the narrative so that we can protect um, all Americans. Um, for the gun violence issue, the Ad Council has approached it a little bit differently. We're looking at homes that currently have a firearm. We know um, that is on the increase right now. About 44% of households have a firearm. Um, and the way that we look at it through the work that we've been doing recently and that we'll be expanding over the next few years is in partnership with Brady to make sure that if you do own a firearm, you understand the risk um, of having that firearm in the home to your children um, and others that may uh, live in the household, and that you make sure you securely store it and do so safely. So that means unloaded, locked, and away from your ammunition. Um, for us, in the, in the immediate um, situation, that is the most important message that we can get out to the American public. Um, and the importance of sort of changing that cultural narrative is that much of the discussion right now in the media is about guns. And what we want to do is shift that. It's not a gun issue. It's a health issue. It's about protecting your family, protecting your children, and making sure that if you are a gun owner, you're a responsible gun owner. And all of our research shows that if you are a gun owner, you believe that safely securing your firearm is the responsible thing to do. What often happens is people aren't necessarily taking the necessary steps to keep their children away from accessing that firearm. Um, and one of the things that, that we've been finding in our research and the data proves out is that you know, having access to an unsecured firearm is really an indicator of all, the, whether it's an unintentional shooting, um, gun suicide, um, even school shootings. You know, 76% of school shootings involve somebody having access to an unsecured firearm from the home. So our approach really is focusing on those gun owners and making sure that that firearm is safely secured so that it doesn't result in the outcomes that we're seeing right now. This is great. So I want to spend some time recognizing, right, that um, we're not a monolith uh, in the United States. We are comprised of a plurality with lots of cultures, lots of norms to shift. Um, and our experience of violence uh, differs across the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, the Javi partnered with researchers at Data for Progress, and we conducted a naturally representative survey looking at um, how people viewed violence in their own communities. We found overall that uh, a little over 40% of folks, or excuse me, 60% of folks uh, were concerned about violence. But when we disaggregated by race, we found uh, over 80% of African Americans and Latinos are very concerned about violence in their communities. Yeah. This is a reality. But to Michael's point earlier, we also found evidence of optimism that over 80% Republicans, Democrats, independents believed that we could do something about violence. I want to hear you all talk about how you understand these targeted communities you've, you've mentioned. Are there other uh, intersections or intersectionality to consider? And how do you then convey various messages to these respective audiences? Either one of you can start. Anthony, you want to yeah, start? Yeah, I'm, start? I'm happy Go to jump it. in. I mean, you're right in that there's, there's no one way to communicate around any issue, whether it's a public health issue, a safety issue, a uh, social justice issue. Everyone brings their own um, history and mindset to, to a potential uh, challenge. A lot of the work that we do, everything that we do, is really research-based, and, and we go out and we talk to our audience. So first and foremost, you have to understand who it is you're talking to and where you can really make that, that impact, and then how do you reach them with a particular message. 
Um, one of the things that we found to be most successful is once you understand what message will resonate most, in our case, we know that parents want to protect their kids, right? So we start there. Um, the second level was where can we make the greatest impact, and we focused on gun owners. So with that cross-section of parents and gun owners, we can sort of uh, create the demographic profile that we want to reach. Um, that being said, even within that profile, there's different understanding of gun issues in different communities, and um, whether it's um, you know, regional or cultural. And so um, what we found to be really successful is looking at who are the trusted messengers that can deliver these messages. Um, it needs to be authentic. I think you know, all of us in this room have personal stories. I was at dinner last night with a number of you and um, heard some really profound stories. And I think what happens, and I think it was mentioned earlier in some of the remarks, is that those stories don't get shared. Um, and sharing those stories is important, and doing it from voices and messengers that different communities and different populations can trust and look to um, is really important. And so that's part of our strategy in addition to you know, doing traditional things um, like advertising and marketing and social media, it's finding trusted voices that can tell these stories to connect with parents, um, people that are from the communities that different individuals are living in, um, that have a similar perspective or background so that there can be a connection and that it can resonate. So like Anthony, our work really begins with the research. And to the question about you know, different demographic groups and the different ways that they experience gun violence, you know, a variable that we've really honed in on is age. So you know, everyone in this room knows very well that by the time we get to be adults, we tend to get fairly set in our ways and our, our views solidify and, and are very hard to change. But when we're younger, those views are still forming, and that's very much the case when it comes to guns. So, you know, I started talking about the shift in the way the public understands the risks around gun use. Well, we learned that the steepest shift in that curve has actually come among younger people, those under 30. So we set out to really deeply understand what was going on with young people when it came to guns. And we learned a lot through our research. We learned that the teen and young adult years are a pivotal period for decision making when it comes to guns. Young people are already talking with their peers about guns, but they don't have any solid data or information about the risks and responsibilities around having and using guns. They're interested to learn more, but they don't know where to go to get that information. And finally, most young people are not connected to existing, more activist organizations working in this space. Certainly, we're familiar with the young activists who have taken up this issue, but, but that's a small sliver uh, of young people. Most you know, fall somewhere in the middle on this issue and are frankly you know, turned off by what they see as the polarized nature of the gun debate. They don't want to be forced to feel like they have to pick a side. So what all of that told us was that there was an opportunity here to have a different kind of conversation with young people when it comes to guns. And so we're not asking them to pick a side. We're inviting them to get the information they need to make a choice that's right for their health and safety and the health and safety of those close to them. Now, we also know that even young people aren't monolithic. And so, while our first campaign is reaching young people who fall into this sort of movable middle who haven't made up their minds about guns, our plans for this year include a campaign that will be much more focused on young people who are living in communities that are hardest hit by gun violence. And our plans for next year include a campaign that hones in on the intersection between mental health, firearm suicide, and gun access that will be accessible even to teens in more rural parts of the country. So people are experiencing this issue in different ways, and we need to meet them where they are with the information they need so that they can make the best decision for their health and safety and those who are close to them. Thank you. 
there, I'm, I'm looking at the time and thinking, my goodness, I have 10 more questions for you all. Um, you know, at the Javi, we, uh, we serve victims of gun violence. Um, in our programs, we have served about 10,000, over 10,000 uh, annually. And we often say that those who are closest to the pain are closest to the solution. Um, I'm curious what, what voices you work to elevate in this space and, and how you both engage the optimism and the tragedy, how you recognize that this is complex, very complex issue with lots of different solutions and offer people concrete opportunities to take action. Those are, those are paradoxical in many ways. How do, you, how do you square that circle? And any advice you might offer, we've got a, n a number of people here, leaders from the healthcare sector, any advice you might offer us for how to sit in that paradox and, and find a place for us to take action? So we're working with teens, as I've said, and you know one thing we've learned both from our research and in real life is that Gun violence is touching teens in, in multiple ways in, at, at, at large scale. And so you know, we're finding in our research that fully 50%, 50% of members of Gen Z, so between 13 and 25, 50% say that either they have had a personal experience with gun violence or a close friend or family member has. And when we ask black and Latino, young people, it jumps to 60%, who have had a personal experience with gun violence. So when we work with teens through our, our youth council and through local networks, we are finding that they all have some kind of experience with this issue. Either they have been involved in a mass shooting situation. One of our uh, young youth council members was at the Fourth of July parade in Highland Park last summer. Another experienced a shooting in a shopping mall where she was hanging out with her friends. Others have been involved in violence at the community level. So they all know this issue firsthand. And that makes them incredibly effective messengers and ambassadors to talk to their peers about gun violence and the risks of, of using guns. And so that's worked really well for us. We're really relying on a peer-to-peer -peer model for young people to spread this message since they are, as you said, Fatima, so close to this issue. Yeah. Yeah, for us, you know, it's gun owners talking to other gun owners, first and foremost, because that's our audience. Um, they're the most credible uh, in this space. And I think one of the things, regardless of who the messenger is um, and who the audience is that you're reaching, is to give people something very specific and tangible. Um, you know, when you're dealing with some of these tragedies, um, they're very powerful and emotional. People tend to listen to that information at that moment and then compartmentalize it or put it aside, go back to their day-to-day -day lives, right? We all have many challenges in our days. We have our families you know, our situations that we're dealing with, and it's easy to move on. And I think that's sort of the cadence that we start to see in the media is that, you know, you have a school shooting, there's lots of attention paid to it, and then people move on uh, and they go back to their lives. And what I think we found, whether it's this issue or issues like, you know, seat belts or other healthcare issues, whether it's high blood pressure or cancer prevention, um, it's about giving people practical information and tips that they can enact right away for themselves, for their families, for their communities. Um, and that's what we found to be most effective. And you can expand the issues that you talk about over time, but you need to bring it in and let people have that conversation. So we, we really commend Northwell for the work that they're doing because they're bringing the, the conversation about guns to the forefront of families. That would never happen, right? You would never even think to do that in many cases. What we're trying to do is something similar where we're saying, if you own a firearm, this is something that you can do practically, an action you can take to, to you know, take control and actually have an effect on this issue. Um, and then we can expand and, and start to talk about other issues related to guns and gun safety. But um, what we found, again, being most successful is giving people practical, actionable steps that they can take 
so they can be empowered um, in their daily lives and it doesn't become something that you know comes and goes over over time or with the news cycle. I would like to perhaps end with um, two recommendations to impart. I think uh, the first, I want to give a, a special shout out to Dr. Emmy Betts, who convened a few of us who are in this room, Chetan Satyai, um, uh, Megan Rainey, Dr. Jill uh, Harkavy Friedman, and Rob Pincus, to talk about uh, the fact that in gun violence prevention, word, words matter. And the words we choose to use to even talk about or frame the issue uh, have impact, whether it has communities lean in or, or take a step back. And uh, you know this important work that you all are doing with gun owners and with teens, you all are, and this is the second recommendation, focused on the research, right? And, and I think any of us who endeavor to take on this issue, test your messaging, test your assumptions about what messages are going to res resonate and what messengers are going to resonate. And please share it with us, right? Share with all of us what you're learning because we're all learning as well. Uh, thank you all so much uh, for this opportunity. Thank you, Northwell, for having this incredibly important discussion. It's quite rare for us to talk about culture change, and we've all got some part to play in it. Thank you so much.